And Helen is going to talk to us about her experience when she was with British Gas. Um, and you've got 30 minutes, Helen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good <laughs> afternoon. I feel really sorry for you. You've had coal, you've had water, you've had electricity, and now I'm afraid you've got gas. There are some differences, but I'll do my best to, um, to keep you awake. Um, it's going to be a bit of a gallop because uh, it's, it's quite a lot I'd, I'd like to say, but I am sp sticking strictly to 67 to 86, which is the period when natural gas became the fuel and when the gas corporation was nationalised. So anything after that I will mention briefly, but um, I'd left by then, so I don't know what was going on. Um, I'd also like, I've got a few key words that I've picked up during the day, and I just want to throw them in to keep them in your mind, and then maybe if we need to, we can come back to them. There was a mention of waste or no waste, of biological balance, I think that's all very um, relevant. Anti-suburban was another phrase I liked. The clutter of the wires and the electricity industry, I think that's relevant. Um, Screening around the site. I was surprised at Ron Hebblethwaite saying that. But anyway, we'll come back to that. Um, excellent designs through professional collaboration. I think that's very key. Um, landscape pattern. Genius cannot be hired. I think that was a risky comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that'll do. That'll do. Okay, um, most of us, uh, hang on, I'm trying to do two things at once here, so it'll be an almighty disaster, I'm sure. Most of us, I think, assume, uh, are pretty knowledgeable about that aspect of the gas industry. Um, it's very nostalgic. It's not just about gas holders, it's about all the paraphernalia went with it, and I love that picture because it's got a picture of a gas lamp in it. Um, all sorts of sad things happen to... The, um, the telescopes, the gas holder uh, bits that went up and down. Some of them are very beautiful, very neglected. Some of them have come down in the world a bit. See if I can get the... I always think that's a bit sad. This is Bromley by Bow. And I think that one's absolutely gorgeous. That's um, Cold Drops Yard with the, the holder and inside residential flats echoing the tank that used to be there. I think that's absolutely wonderful. But... What I'm going to talk about is the brave new world of natural gas. We were so excited about working on this fuel. We thought we were the bee's knees. It was clean. It was non-toxic. It didn't produce horrible residues in the ground. So little did we know, working on a carbon fuel, what it was going to be like in a few years' time. So, but at the time, we thought we were wonderful. I'm going to go through a very little bit of history just to give you the background. Um, how many of you could say, hand on heart, that you knew a piece of natural gas infrastructure, that you could either name it or have seen it? Whoa. Where, which one? Oh, the gas holders. No. Oh, natural gas. No, no, no. no Stan's gas. My central heating boiler is natural gas. Yeah, OK, that's fine. <laughs> I'll allow that one. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, it was. It isn't yes. now, but it was. Yes, exactly. Most of you, I'm glad to say, are uh, silently congratulating the Environmental Planning Department of Natural Gas, of British Gas, from doing a fantastically good job. Um, but just to go back to what came first, one of the oldest companies in Britain, the Gaslight and Coke Company, it had an enormous impact on urban landscapes. First of all, it lit streets and I think that's something that people forget when they think about the polluting nature of town's gas. It did make a huge difference. But it did create industrial style gas works in, uh, in urban areas. They were built near the client, near the customer, um, not out in rural areas or in areas that were perhaps more fringe on, on towns. The gas holders came in surprisingly late. I didn't know this until I was researching this lecture. It was 1890. They produce phenomenal air pollution, of course. I don't know if you've ever seen the f old photographs of children being lined up outside a town's gas um, installation because people felt that the ghastly fumes were very good for um, uh, lung infections and respiration. <laughs> and the kids were just stood outside to breathe in this ghastly muck. And, of course, the, the process also left very polluting materials in the ground. So it wasn't the keen and wonderful thing that um, we thought we were working with. 
1947, these dates are now very familiar, the nationalisation of the British coal industry, which of course was providing the fuel for Towns Gas, and closely followed in 1948 by the nationalisation of the gas industry, the creation of the Gas Council, as it was called then, and the regional gas boards. I don't know about you, but I was a sea gas girl. Um, 1960s, things began to change, the increasing price of coal, and they began the import to oil-based gas and turning it into liquefied natural gas. And Canvey there, that rather lurid picture of Canvey Island, um, was one of the earliest um, ports where the gas was brought in and stored. Um, 1965, and it all changes. BP get strikes gas in West Seoul, 42 miles off the Yorkshire Lincolnshire coast, and everything changes. The first gas arrived at Easington, East Yorkshire, in 1967, and the Gas Council announces the conversion of Britain from coal gas to natural gas. It was a phenomenal operation, but this cheap home-owned fuel was regarded very, very highly. 40 million appliances converted, including my mother's bedroom gas fire, which had probably been installed in 1928. Um, that gave them a problem. 50 million pounds worth of work and 10 years um, work. I remember standing on the um, coast, in the Thettlethorpe gas terminal on the Lincolnshire coast, staring out to sea, at this murky during the day picture, but at night, the gas rigs all around the horizon, all twinkling their lights. It was an absolutely extraordinary sight, um, very much part of that world. 1972, Gas Council abolished, replaced by the British Gas Corporation. Sorry about the rather naff um, logo there. I had to cut it out of the publication earlier, I've got to find now. <coughs> and the landscape had already begun to change. The last gas works closed, um, the last ones for Scotland, followed by Northern Ireland in the 1980s. Um, remember this, anybody? Yeah. Yes, I thought so. I never did find Sid myself. 1986, it was all over. Margaret Thatcher privatised Gas Corporation, along with many other things. Um, the shares were floated on the stock, mar stock market in December of that year, by which time I had just left, unfortunately, so that was a shame. Um, Right, new infrastructure, new landscape, very much so. Key elements are, and we'll go through these in a little bit more detail, because I think the shapes that they made were very interesting, the terminals, the pipelines, the compressor stations, and the gas storages. Okay, the gas terminals were traditionally on the east coast, because that's where the gas was coming ashore from the North Sea. St Fergus in Aberdeenshire, an enormous terminal. Easington in East Yorkshire, we've mentioned. Thettlethorpe <coughs> in Lincolnshire. Um, that's uh, um, an original photograph of the... Oh, I'm sorry. Have you got it there? No, sorry. How's that? That's Thettlethorpe. Um, very interesting. The engineers were very puzzled because the interior designers made the carpets go up the walls as well as over the floor. <laughs> it was very trendy. Um, and Backton in Norfolk, which we will definitely come back to. The terminals were very large acreages, very complex engineering, and um, quite difficult to site. The oil companies brought the gas ashore, they dewatered it, they uh, took the sludge out of it. It was then passed through an enormous valve where it was measured so that it was absolutely certain that what came in from one side was coming out at the other. And of course the smell was added because natural gas is both odourless and non-toxic. Um, right, these mysterious compressor stations. Has anyone ever heard of the compressor stations? They were built at about 40 mile intervals down the, the main grid transmission lines. Um, it was really annoying. They had to be built on the pipelines. I know that sounds blatantly obvious, but we kept finding these amazing sites. They thought, oh no, it's nowhere near the gas line, so that was no use. Um, they were driven by jet engines. Um, RB211s and Avons were very popular at the time. And they had the potential to be extremely noisy. Well, they were extremely noisy. But they were encased in very futuristic buildings 
such that when you turned up on site, you just heard a hum until somebody opened the cab door and you were flattened by the noise that came out. Then they'd shut the cab door again and you'd go back to a hum. They were amazing pieces of engineering. Those there, you can see the air intakes at one end and there would be um, an exhaust stack at the other end. And finally, the gas storage facilities. Again, this is about when the kettle goes on at half time in the cup final. You needed to have some sort of ability to inject gas into the system very quickly. Um, Glen Mavis near Glasgow, Partington near Manchester, Avonmouth near Bristol, and the Isle of Grain. Um, they were the key ones, there were others, but they were very, very large tanks. Those three large tanks would take a phenomenal amount of gas. Um, liquefied natural gas is, I always have to look at that, it's one six hundredth of the, the gaseous volume in its liquid form. So you can get a heck of a lot of gas in these tanks. They were all, apart from grain, on the western end, so the gas came in from the east, went down the pipes to the customers in between, and the storages were built to take what was left at the western end. Grain was still um, was built to um, back up Canvey because gas was still coming in by tanker, and that was coming in from the east. Pipelines. I'm not going to mention much about pipelines, which I think is a real shame because we always considered that they buried their mistakes and that we, had, we couldn't do that. Um, but gas pipelines were large. I think I said somewhere earlier they were about a metre diameter. The gas went down to £1,000 per square inch. Um, so you could not put the lines in anywhere near an urban area. They had to be buried and they were very carefully marked and the helicopters flew them all the time to make sure there was no damage. A lot of them went through agricultural land which is already disturbed. You build the trench, you take the topsoil off, you look after it like gold dust, you pick up your pipe in um, great slings, stick it in the hole, backfill with the um, subsoil, Respread the topsoil, drain it, add a bit of fertilizer because that's what you did in those days, and it went back to an agricultural purpose with a great deal of ease. There were areas, I feel I have to say this about pipelines, that went through moorland, and in fact, they did an awful lot of work with Liverpool University. One or two of you may be aware of this. It's um, Heathland Restoration Handbook of Techniques, published by British Gas, and I think uh, Messrs. Putwain and Gwillem, Gwillem? Gillam had a lot to do with researching and coming up with restoration techniques, which I think are still of use today. Um, I didn't work for the pipelines department. They were a separate unit. So as my unit had one landscape architect, me, um, the other unit had one horticulturist stroke farmer, Sid, not the Sid that, um, <laughs> and so we, we felt quite lonely, so we did talk to each other quite a lot, but we weren't, we worked alongside them, not with them, and if we wanted to find a new site, we'd be parking our car, we'd have the maps open on the bonnet, and we'd tell everyone we were working for pipelines. Got us out of a lot of trouble, that did. So... That is basically the infrastructure that was required to move natural gas ashore and then on through the system. Um, the, there were three big problems with the environmental planning side of things. First of all, these things had potential to create a significant impact on the British countryside. The terminals were the biggest, but even a compressor station, which is the size of a British church with a tower, very, very similar, but rather different in purpose. Secondly, the system had to be constructed in rural areas, so we weren't impacting on towns, we were impacting in the countryside. Well, there are the stats on the pipelines. That's actually just outside the Bacton Terminal. Um, and thirdly, the Bacton Terminal, which was the second one to be built, resulted in a mammoth, absolutely mammoth planning inquiry. And it was extraordinarily expensive, extraordinarily time consuming. And in fact, I will just read you a quote, if I may, because I find it a really very interesting prospect, assuming I can find it, here we are. 
And I'm sorry that this is about architects, um, as there, there were for architects, read landscape architects as well. Another great opportunity to extend the architect's role had presented itself, complicated this time by the presence of four clients. This is at Backton, all engaged in developing the same site. Three of them were commercially competing international oil companies. The fourth customer, the fourth was the customer the oil companies were serving, that was British Gas. Each client body was made up of an experienced group of administrators and engineers, British, American and Dutch, each supported by different international technical consultants and all with their own preconceptions, often based on bitter experience. And talking of bitter experience, I haven't put my microphone on, so allow me just to do that. I found that um, very telling, also slightly amusing, I have to say. But um, um, So, after Bacton, the corporation decided a new philosophy was required to plan and build the um, natural gas infrastructure. I'm so sorry. I'll just give you another look at Bacton. I'm not going, I'm doing very well on this. So that was the Bacton size. You can see it's a sizable, sizable development. Um, the ensuing philosophy. Uh, okay. Never write or say anything which you cannot defend in a public inquiry. <laughs> Our boss was deeply scarred by Bacton. <laughs> and Frank Dean, who was the Chief Environmental Planning Officer, maintained that his department would never, ever allow such a thing to happen again. So, a new team was developed. The Environmental Planning Department, uh, which was based in headquarters in London, um, was expanded. Uh, including people like myself, and it sat alongside the construction department in London HQ. Now, you would think that that was a sensible thing to do. Actually, it wasn't always very clever because the engineers had uh, a time pro frame to meet. They wanted to get things built as fast as possible, where well, we were being told to make sure we didn't end up with another damn public inquiry and get it right first time, and we would take longer to do what they wanted to do in a hurry. So it didn't always work being next to each other. Um, but the Environmental Planning Department was supported by consultant architects and landscape <coughs> architects, which I'll come on to in a moment. And also there were in-house architects. One of them was very naive when he arrived and he was working on one of the telescope holders and he'd painted it in wonderful zigzag colours in his mind until he realised that when the holder went down, all the zigs and zags didn't line up anymore. So that one was out of the window and he had to build another one. But um, he soon learned. Um, the consultants which were engaged and whose quote I read out just now was a group called Architects Design Group, ADG, um, led by Gordon Graham. I don't know if that's a name that's familiar to yourselves. It was multidisciplinary. They did have a landscape architectural uh, section. They were the ones that came on and serviced the three oil companies and the gas corporation at Bacton and were subsequently reappointed to British Gas and remained in that role for very many years. That's one of their, that was the model they built of Bacton, which is one of the archive photographs they sent me, and for which I was very grateful. Um, the key elements that were used to find the sites for this installation were environmental and visual impact assessment. Um, is Richard still here? I'm sure Elius. LUC, no, sorry, the other Richard Flenley, um, they were very involved with environmental impact and visual impact assessment. The second plank was using inspiring architectural design in collaboration with the engineers. The third plank was a rigorous approach to siting. Why were they all built in flat areas? It didn't make life difficult. And the third, fourth one was, was consultation. So just looking at, at those items, um, 
Frank Dean, the Chief Environmental Planning Officer, and Gordon Graham, the Principal Consultant, were very, very committed to environmental impact assessment. I put the picture there of Silent Spring because many people suggest that Rachel Carson was one of the people that really started the need for environmental impact assessment. Um, British Gas became very aware of the need for a much more objective way of making decisions, of presenting material. Uh, it was interesting, a lot of the oil companies, the energy companies, which were all very active, as we now know from today, in finding sites and building infrastructure. BNFL, British Nuclear Fields, were terribly anti, apparently, um, EIA. Um, they'd seen it work in America and didn't like the results, the Alaska Pipeline. LUC were doing a lot of work on it, and Dean and Graham thought it must be the way forward. Um, one of the problems was that the British planning s system had not been designed to cope with these enormous modern projects. We've already heard about the clash between the, well in our case, the Gas Act in 72 and the Countryside Act in 68. On one hand, British Gas had to provide a consistent supply of fuel, and on the other hand, had to take uh, care of the countryside. That didn't always sit terribly comfortably. Added to that, the gas installations are not footloose. Unfortunately, they do have to be fairly close to the pipelines for obvious reasons. So the choice of potential sites and choice of the sites is very limited. Uh, so it really supported the need for a well-structured approach and to use EIA to make the best of the few sites that were available. I did enjoy Frank Dean's sense of humour. It is unfortunate that site specification drawn up for natural gas terminal purposes is very often very similar to that of a nat nature reserve or a holiday camp. He was absolutely right. We didn't make life any easier at all. Um, so EIA and visual impact assessment, VIA, became part of the standard practice for the environmental planners supporting the new infrastructure. We were all trained in the discipline. I was one of the few people who had two jobs. Because I came in with a landscape training, I was also known as the tree lady, <laughs> um, obviously with the R in it, but um, most people thought that was just a joke. Um, <laughs> but it did mean that I could do everybody else's job, but nobody else could do mine, which occasionally caused a few problems. But it was a year or so before I was allowed loose on my own. I was shadowing well-trained environmental planners from the department for, for quite a time before I was allowed loose on my own. But it was such a logical discipline. It was so obvious somehow that, in fact, using EIA as a format was so obvious. I thought for many years that British Gas had invented it. Um, it was, you, you had your checklist, you had your way of assessing what the impacts were, you could then write it up, it was logical, it was comparable, um, and you, you learned hugely on the experience from doing it. Those were very slimline EIAs, um, they were probably about that thick, which is nothing now by current standards but they were very well received by uh, the planning authorities. Um, we were backed also by computer skills, which British Gas didn't have landscape computer skills at that time. So ADG were doing the photomontages, which were again, much more, um, felt to be much more reliable by the planners than artists' impressions of what um, the new installation might look like. It was felt that they were probably slightly exaggerated. I don't know why they didn't think the photomontages were slightly exaggerated, but Frank Dean did suggest that it made life a lot easier and a lot quicker um, for his department. Um, it's a bit like the end of a film, this bit, isn't it? After Bacton, no development ever went to public inquiry. Frank Dean pulled it off. Uh, he managed to get through the rest of them scar-free. But he also estimated that the EIA approach had, over the preceding decade, saved £30 million. How he assessed that, I do not know. But, and this was blatantly obvious to the rest of us, reduced the time to achieve planning permission from over two years, which was common in the energy industry everywhere, 
to an average of 21 weeks, which is pretty good even these days. So it did work. It was effective. Yeah, you may say we found the wrong sites, but I'll show you some sites in the future and you can, and, and later on, and you can uh, see how it goes. Five minutes, right. Okay, um, ADG and later FPCR were the landscape architects and they were committed to a comprehensive view. They said, what's the point of worrying about the office block facade if the tanks and the um, chimneys are all in the wrong place? They looked at the whole thing. Again, I think that's something that's already been... Um, quick whiz round the actual... This is the biggest of the terminals, St Fergus on the Aberdeenshire coast. It's a rotten photograph actually because it shows it from the back, which was the very beautiful side. The roadside was uh, very much a, a chemical, petrochemical installation, but it was neat and it was tidy and it was not full of you know, inconsistent razor wire and uh, uh, guard dogs and so forth but it was an amazing sight this is a winter shot because there was a winter loch in the, there were two lines of dunes along the coast the terminal was behind the dunes in winter of course the winter loch was full of water and you could get photographs like this i mean it was absolutely stunning the um the gravel that covered a lot of the underground pipe work the terns loved it they all nested there the only time in my british gas years when i really needed was a hard hat was when you were doing a site inspection and nesting time it was <laughs> terrifying <laughs> there you can see four compressor units um the <coughs> photographer has very carefully concealed all the rest of the the stuff there this was a promotional shot that was taken but you do get the idea of the care that was put into the design side these are the Glen Mavis um, LNG uh, storages. They had a lot of fun um, designing these. Um, Glen Mavis was on the top of a hill. It was seen against the sky from most areas. They didn't even try to disguise it. Um, they just painted it sky colours in, um, from white down to dark blue. And it was extraordinarily effective, actually, I have to say. Um, Partington was my favourite. Apart from the fact it was built on the best rhubarb triangle near Manchester. Um, the tanks could be seen from three different directions, over fields from an urban area and then all muddled up with the next door petrochemical. And the stripes and the colours that they used to break up the mass of the tanks, um, if you were looking over the countryside they were sort of chrome and silver. If you were looking from the residential areas, it was blue and white and the stripe of orange when you felt like it. You know, they were very imaginative and they were absolutely adored, these. Um, this was um, from the British Gas website. It was pulled down in, uh, what does it say? Nine, uh, I was mortified. I went to see it recently and it wasn't there. And they built it on an existing gas works. The village in um, depended on the gas works for work, here was more work, uh, they loved the stripes and when they pulled it down everybody missed it so it was really quite a, an inspirational thing. That was the only bit of heritage I could find on the site and see what state it was in thereafter. And then the compressor stations, um, Aylesbury, there you can see the exhaust sticking up, the mess of the air intakes, but I just love that three, three line stripey effect on the cabs and here was King's Lynn. That particular model, which I always felt looked like panda eyes, was, was commonly used, and I can show you more of that. Um, I thought they, they were really impressive. I went there thinking, oh no, it'll, it'll look awful, but it didn't, it really didn't look awful. Um, rushing very quickly through, um, site search is obviously hugely important, and we, had to find sites even in totally flat areas where the site was absorbed and blended into the landscape never screened that was a completely forbidden word screening we had to blend it into the landscape topography was the most important but the landscape character was also very important and we would use the landscape character for the landscape a scheme as well but it was almost seen as mitigation um, for specific views mitigation was a um, a bad word as well we didn't mitigate we just blended so um, in a way the, the landscape design was it sounds slightly peripheral but it was never key because it never needed to be key I'll rush through these bits um, it was all about native tree and shrub mixes 
it was about specific views or landscape character additions or to increase biodiversity. Landscape management was taken very, very seriously. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> exactly. That was me. <laughs> I had a wonderful 10 years traveling around Great Britain doing landscape management. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, well, I would say this, wouldn't I? But we didn't need to go through national parks. We didn't need to go through ecological sensitive areas because the pipelines were already there and they'd already avoided them. So in that sense, life was made easy. But the, th this looks like an ornamental pond, which could be in any garden. It's actually the Farwater Lake. And every site had one of these and um, it became enormously important environmental and um, biodiversity features. There was no need for people to tramp around these sites. The engineers sat in centrally heated units with buttons to press. There was no great sort of turning of oil valves. And so there was no human disturbance. So again, wildlife just streamed in through the security fences. There were no pesticides, or very, very few. Um, and you had this very environment, you had water, you had gravel, you had grass, you had trees, and it became, I mean, Settlethorpe, all they did all day was bird watch. They never, you know, they pressed another button and then went back to watching whatever was hanging around on the trees outside. It was a, an extraordinarily um, biodiverse um, environment. Um, there are the dunes at um, St. Fergus again. Um, and finally, consultation um, did become very important, of course. What I loved was the increasingly important recognition of local community and landowners, the interested parties as they were known in those days. And slowly we began to realise that we had to talk to communities. And I spent time on sites explaining the demographic, democratic rights of the landowners to, to complain about this installation, that they did have to write to their local planning authority, that they had rights to stand up and say no they didn't want it, even though once we decided I didn't got planning permission, we'd compulsorily buy the land. Um, but they did have the right to complain and talk to their communities and feed back to us, and that became more and more important, even though one of my colleagues was manhandled out of an exhibition caravan at one point, but I suspect that was his fault rather than anybody else's. <laughs> okay, so want to, can I just whiz through some very last pictures? Oh, please, very quickly. Okay, okay, okay. Um, hidden infrastructural visual intrusion. I remember I this was during the 70s and 80s that we built all these. I went back in the last two or three months to try and find some of the installations and I was quite shocked by what I found, but here we go. Um, there's some more of the, the panda eyes at Peterborough. We, the camera zoomed in on there. We could only find the sites because they were being refurbished and the cranes were standing there. We could not find the sites. We did such a good job, you know, it was so amazing. But it really was. It's only because the postcodes were on the internet that we could even track them down because I couldn't remember who they were. But the long distance views, um, I think that is perfectly acceptable. You may fight me for that, but and the other one, of course, has got both the railway, where's Crystal, and the electricity lines over it. I think they're far more intrusive, actually, than the compressor cabs, but um, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, Huntingdon, another very flat site. Now, here we begin to come on new regulations, new developments. When it was built, it did not look like that. The, the um, air intakes and exhaust did not look like that. So now we have a very different architectural attitude and actually it doesn't really matter because the nearest sites that you can see it from if you remember the public you can hardly see them again this is warrington another very flat site deep in peat mire um, again the exhaust stacks have been heightened i presume that's to do with regulations to be actually i haven't found out why they've been heightened but i imagine it's um, increasing regulatory requirements um, that one is a bit of an eyeful now, I have to admit. Not even I like that particularly, but it didn't look like that when it was built. Um, and then here's back to Aylesbury. Remember those brown and beige stripes? Well, they're still there on the cabs, but now they've got this futuristic thing stuck on the top instead of the original exhaust stacks. And then yeah, it's quite visible. So I leave you with that. The, um, the work that was done when the gas industry was um, nationalised and what has happened since. Thank you.